Hello everyone, today I'll be discussing palpitations. So first off, what exactly are palpitations? Palpitations are the subjective sensation that one's heart is beating either faster or more strongly than normal, or is beating irregularly. Approaching a patient with palpitations is, in some ways, much easier than it is with most symptoms because the list of possible diagnoses in the typical patient is relatively short. However, in other ways, it's much more difficult because unless the patient is experiencing palpitations at the time of your assessment, you'll be unable to make the diagnosis at that moment. And in the majority of times, a person who has experienced palpitations has done so intermittently in discrete, self-limited episodes. Palpitations are usually caused by arrhythmias of some form and usually tachyarrhythmias rather than bradyarrhythmias. Bradyarrhythmias are more likely to present with fatigue, intermittent lightheadedness, or syncope. The best diagnostic framework to use here is based on the actual rhythms involved, and the first distinction is between sinus tachycardia and other rhythms. With, with sinus tach, the rhythm is usually secondary to another disorder associated with increased circulating catecholamines and activity of the sympathetic nervous system. Most conditions which cause sinus tach usually do not cause symptomatic palpitations per se, but will instead cause symptoms more specific to the underlying condition. This includes dehydration, infection, fever, pain, psychosis, pulmonary embolism, anemia, heart failure, and tamponade. Because none of these conditions typically present with palpitations as a prominent manifestation, I'm going to leave them out of the framework. But there are a few other conditions which do occasionally present with sinus tach associated palpitations, even if they aren't the most prominent presenting symptom. These are stimulant intoxication, including legal drugs such as albuterol and anticholinergics, and over-the-counter substances such as caffeine. Also causing palpitations is alcohol, benzodiazepine or beta blocker withdrawal, hypoglycemia, and hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism also predisposes to uh, atrial fibrillation, which I'll list separately in a minute. And anxiety is in this category, which can either be generalized anxiety, situational anxiety, or panic attacks. Finally, under sinus tachycardia, there are two closely related disorders of autonomic dysregulation. One is called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS. In POTS, a person's heart rate dramatically increases when they move from a lying to standing position, but without a significant drop in blood pressure, and also without any other evidence of volume depletion. This is a recently described disease, and its mechanism remains incompletely understood. The other condition of autonomic dysregulation is inappropriate sinus tachycardia, in which the patient has sinus tachycardia that is either elevated at rest, irrespective of position, and or has an exaggerated heart rate response to exercise. Both POTS and inappropriate sinus tachycardia have a female predominance and most commonly present at a relatively young age from late teens to early 40s. The next category in our framework is probably best just labeled other arrhythmias and includes the subcategories of tachyarrhythmias, bradyarrhythmias, and premature beats. Under tachyarrhythmias, the most common rhythms here are atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. There is also a term supraventricular tachycardia, or SVT. Although usage of that term varies across specialties, I think it is the most helpful when applied as cardiologists do, as an umbrella term that includes AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, better known as AVNRT, the similarly named AV reentrant tachycardia, or AVRT, which is the primary arrhythmia seen in Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, and atrial tachycardia. Last is ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia has its own differential diagnosis, which includes post MI scar, active ischemia, cardiomyopathy of any cause, and long QT syndrome, among other more rare diseases. Under bradyarrhythmias, the primary ones that occasionally can cause palpitations are slow AFib, which essentially means atrial fibrillation with a very high degree of AV block. The palpitations are, of course, on account of its irregularity. 
there is also complete heart block on account of the times when the atria and ventricles contract simultaneously. However, as I said earlier, all forms of bradycardia are more likely to cause lightheadedness than palpitations, including these two. Premature beats, either premature atrial contractions or premature ventricular contractions, can also cause palpitations. What patients likely feel is not the premature beat itself, which usually generates a smaller than normal contraction, or sometimes no contraction at all, but instead they feel the accentuated contraction that immediately follows the compensatory pause after the premature beat. This accentuated contraction occurs because the longer diastolic filling time following a premature beat leads to greater myocardial stretch, which then results in greater myocardial contraction for the single beat after the pause on account of the Frank-Starling relationship. The most common causes of palpitations in adults are atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, and anxiety disorders, with the arrhythmias being more common among patients presenting to the emergency room and anxiety being more common among patients presenting to primary care clinic. When assessing a patient with palpitations, what are the most important features to elicit during the initial encounter? In the history, ask about the duration and timing of palpitations. Is this something that just started or has it been happening for years? How frequent are the episodes and how long do they last? And of course, is the patient experiencing palpitations at this moment? Ask if the patient has noticed a specific trigger for them, such as exercise, standing up too quickly, or use of a specific medication, such as albuterol. What are the quality of the palpitations? For example, is the patient experiencing a heartbeat that is too fast, one that is irregular, one that is too strong, or all of the above? Are there associated symptoms, such as dyspnea, lightheadedness, syncope, chest pain, or anxiety? Is there a personal history of cardiac disease or cardiovascular risk factors? Does the patient have a history of recent alcohol or illicit drug use? And is there a family history of early sudden cardiac death, which is variably defined, but could be considered to have occurred if a person under the age of 40, who had been presumably healthy, suddenly dropped dead without explanation? This suggests the possibility of a congenital arrhythmogenic disease, such as long QT syndrome, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or other rarer conditions. Last in the history, ask about recent life stressors which could be contributing to anxiety. A patient's vitals are always relevant to some extent, though with palpitations, unless the patient currently has an arrhythmia at that exact moment, vitals will usually be normal. If an arrhythmia is not currently present, in the absence of heart failure, the physical exam in a patient presenting with palpitations is usually unremarkable. However, a cardiac exam might reveal a murmur of mitral regurgitation, which could predispose the patient to atrial fibrillation. Check orthostatic vital signs if the history is consistent with POTS, and consider a thyroid exam looking for enlargement, tenderness, or nodules that could be associated with a cause of hyperthyroidism. Lab tests are rarely helpful in patients presenting with palpitations. Of course, check a TSH and a free T4 if the history is consistent with hyperthyroidism, and check a urine tox screen if there is a suggestion of drug intoxication and or withdrawal. But so-called routine labs, such as a CBC, chemistry panel, and LFTs, they really aren't indicated unless the patient describes additional relevant features in the history, such as shortness of breath, end-stage renal disease, etc., or unless something turns up in the physical exam. And all patients, however, should get an ECG at the time of their initial presentation. Even if anarrhythmia is not currently present, an ECG can still uncover evidence of past infarction, chamber enlargement, or hallmark features of a congenital arrhythmogenic syndrome. When it comes to a diagnostic algorithm, from the information we've gathered up front, particularly from the ECG, patients will fall into one of a few categories. Consider if the ECG shows sinus tach and the blood pressure is currently normal or elevated. In this case, a thorough history and exam will almost always determine an obvious etiology of the sinus tach from the prior list. If it does not, consider checking a CBC to rule out anemia, and if not already done, a TSH and free T4 to rule out hyperthyroidism as well as a urine tox screen.
If the ECG shows sinus tac but the blood pressure is low, the tachycardia is likely a compensatory response to the low blood pressure, and the patient should be assessed for etiologies of hypotension, which is a whole other diagnostic algorithm. It would be highly unusual to present with palpitations as the primary symptomatic manifestation of hypotension. If the ECG shows an arrhythmia other than sinus tac, and if the arrhythmia can be clearly identified, the first step of the diagnosis is made. The second diagnostic step would then be to assess if there's a particular reason why the patient has that arrhythmia. So for a patient with atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, this would include an echocardiogram to assess for a cardiomyopathy, occult valvular disease, and left atrial size. For an SVT, an echo is usually ordered as well, but most patients should additionally be referred to a cardiac electrophysiologist for either antiarrhythmic therapy and or an ablation procedure. And in fact, ablation procedures can also be done for atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation as well if antiarrhythmic therapy has not been successful. If the patient has VT, additional workup should again include an echo, as well as include some form of ischemia workup. And these patients should also be referred to an electrophysiologist. Now, what if the ECG shows an arrhythmia that is so fast that one really can't say what its mechanism is? Well, if the atrial activity is unclear, a valsalva maneuver or carotid sinus massage can terminate some arrhythmias, such as AVNRT and AVRT, and can slow down AV conduction enough to reveal hidden atrial activity in atrial flutter and some atrial tachycardias. If neither of these is successful, administration of adenosine can be considered. Adenosine is a very quick-acting medication whose primary effect on the heart is to induce AV block. After being pushed, it has a typical duration of action of only 5 to 10 seconds, but during those seconds, the patient will experience cardiac standstill, in which their heart is literally not beating at all. This can cause a very brief but highly uncomfortable sensation for the patient. Once the arrhythmia is diagnosed, you're over back to the left box. However, among patients presenting with palpitations as the primary symptom, particularly in the outpatient setting, the most common scenario is that the palpitations are not currently present and the ECG shows normal sinus rhythm. In the absence of a very compelling reason that this is not necessary, such patients should get an ambulatory ECG monitor with further workup dependent upon its results. The specifics of the ambulatory ECG monitors are constantly changing with evolving technology Regardless of which device is being used, if an episode of palpitations occurs while the device is on, it will either capture the arrhythmia, in which case the specific diagnosis can usually be made, or it will demonstrate that there was no arrhythmia at the time. This suggests that the palpitations are not due to an arrhythmia, and more serious consideration should be given to anxiety as an etiology. However, keep in mind that just because one episode of palpitations is due to anxiety while the monitor is being worn, does not mean that the initial episode that occurred before the monitor was also due to anxiety. So for some patients whose history is strongly suggestive of an arrhythmia, it may take more than one episode of palpitations to occur in the absence of an arrhythmia on monitor before that possibility is ruled out. In addition to an ambulatory monitor, any patients whose exam demonstrates evidence of structural heart disease, such as a pathologic murmur or elevated JVP, or whose ECG demonstrates evidence of structural heart disease, such as pathologic Q waves or hypertrophy, should also get an echocardiogram. That's it for an approach to palpitations. Key takeaway points. Palpitations are usually due to an arrhythmia of some kind, including sinus tachycardia. The most common etiologies are atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, and anxiety. All patients with palpitations warrant an ECG, though it will be unremarkable in the majority of patients not actively experiencing the symptom at the time of evaluation. And last, if the ECG shows normal sinus rhythm, most patients warrant an ambulatory ECG monitor, plus or minus an echocardiogram if there's evidence of structural heart disease. For those viewers wanting more information about how to distinguish between different tachyarrhythmias based on their ECG characteristics, as well as more information about congenital arrhythmogenic diseases, I recommend checking out my video series on ECG interpretation. There will be a link in the video description.